Welcome to part 10 of the Mojo project. This video discusses some yet unsolved mysteries in planet formation. And the contribution of the project has been uh, to point out clearly some bottlenecks in our current understanding of planet formation in a number of review papers that we have written. So we'll detail here on six main problems that we need to understand quickly in order to progress in uh, on planet formation. So the first mystery is where and when the first planetesimals formed. Because in the videos that we presented for the Mojo project, we spoke about planet formation, the growth of planetary embryos and planetary cores as due to uh, some planetesimals growing up by accreting pebbles. But the question remains on how did these planetesimals form in first place? And the current understanding is that planetesimals form from pebbles, because as pebbles drift in the disk, they can spontaneously clump, as we can see in this video, which shows the projection of a, on the plane of a little portion of the disk, and the colors show the density of solids, and the red colors means high density, black color means low density. So the pebbles spontaneously clump in the disk, this process is called streaming instability, and from these clumps, some 100 kilometer planetesimals can form. However, the simulations show that for the streaming instability to be effective, the initial mass ratio between the solids and the gas in the disk has to be a few times the value that characterizes the initial protoplanetary disk around the Sun. So the question that remains open is how did this ratio grow and uh, did it happen uniformly or did it happen specifically at some locations or where and when did the first planetesimals form? And this is very important because the first planetesimals are then those which grow to become protoplanets. And so we cannot have an effective theory of planet formation if we don't understand the formation of the planetesimals. A second big mystery is why giant planets seem to migrate more slowly than our current theories predict. This diagram shows the extrasolar planets known to date in, uh, with respect to the semi-major axis, the size of their orbit on the horizontal axis, and the planet mass on the vertical axis. Each black dot is an extrasolar planet known, and the red dots show the solar system planets for comparison. We have seen in part seven that the group of super-Earths, close-in super-Earths, is consistent with these planets having formed further out beyond the snow line and have migrated inwards. So for super-Earths, migration is not a problem, and uh, migration models are perfectly appropriate to understand the origin of this planet. However, there is another group of planets, which is the giant planets, that are located between 1, 2, 3 AU. These are called the warm Jupiters. And the planets are there today, and according to our current understanding of how they migrate, to be at that location at the time the disk disappeared, this planet should have migrated from beyond 20 or 30 U, so it should have started to form beyond 20 and 30 U. And this is problematic. We think that planet formation at these distances from the star is not very effective. So probably giant planets migrate more slowly than we currently estimate, and we need to understand why. So we need to understand better giant planet migration. A third big problem is to understand the mass of the giant planets. So giant planets formed by accreting gas from the disk around massive cores. And this gas accretion is very fast. So planets grow really quickly. Even if they open a gap, they can still accrete gas from the disk. And they actually can accrete most of the gas that flows through the disk. And according to the typical rate at which gas flows through the disk, which is measured, planets should uh, increase their mass exponentially. And a planet like Jupiter should double its mass in a time which is very short, just 100,000 years, which is a tiny fraction of the disk lifetime. So the question is why giant planets typically have a mass of the order of Jupiter's mass, and they are not all tens of Jupiter mass, so super giant planets. These three open questions are probably related to the fourth open question, which is what is the actual structure of protoplanetary disks? Protoplanetary disks are complicated. And so far, all models have been developed in somewhat simple framework in which we assume that disks are viscous. These are called alpha disks. And alpha disks are well understood and fairly simple. 
So for instance, the density of gas shown here on the vertical axis as a function of the distance from the star on the horizontal axis decays smoothly with distance. But now it seems that disks are not very viscous and most of the transport of gas towards the star happens on the surface of the disk due to some effects called disk winds. And disk winds are, disk disks are clearly different from the alpha disks. In some models, like the red model, the density of gas still declines smoothly with distance, but in other models, like the green model here, it first increases and then decreases. And these different shapes have profound implications on the migration of pebbles, on the formation of planetesimals and planets, on the migration of super Earths, on the migration of giant planets, and even on giant planet growth. So we need to understand better what is the actual structure of these protoplanetary disks. A fifth problem is uh, to understand what is the physical structure of super Earths. So we have seen in part seven that many stars have closed in super Earths which are a little bit bigger than the Earth and closer to the star than the Earth is to the Sun. And when we know for these super-Earths both the planet mass here reported on the horizontal axis and the planet radius here reported on the vertical axis, we can estimate what is the bulk composition of the planet. And we see that there is a huge diversity of composition. Some planets are very big for their mass which means that they have to contain a lot of water and probably they have thick atmospheres of hydrogen and helium. But there are a number of super Earths with masses up to five Earth masses, which seem to have an Earth-like composition. There are other super Earths which at a comparable mass, they are much bigger. So they are clearly different in composition from the Earth. But a number of, of super Earths seem to have the same bulk composition of the Earth and Venus. Uh, so, but these planets are very close to the central star, so presumably they formed in the disk and migrated to be there. And uh, so this leads to a sub-question. So how would the Earth look like if it had formed much faster than the actual Earth? We know that the Earth formed in many tens of millions of years on a time scale exceeding the lifetime of the protoplanetary disk. And if these super Earths with a bulk Earth-like composition formed entirely within, within the lifetime of the disk, they must have formed in a time scale which is 10 to 100 times faster. So we need to understand how a planet which has the same composition of the Earth but forms faster looks like in the end. And this is a big geophysical problem that needs to be investigated in the future. Finally, we have seen in part four that thanks to the Mojo project, we now have three valid models of how things happened in the solar system in order to generate the terrestrial planets that we know and the asteroid belt that we know. We have the Grand Tech model in which the giant planets first migrated in and then migrated out, which is illustrated in the left part of the plot. We have the low mass asteroid belt model in which initially planetesimals and planetary embryos only formed in a narrow ring around 1 AU and not much mass, uh, plan not many planetesimals formed in the asteroid belt. And again, a lot of bodies formed in the giant planet region, which is illustrated in the central part of this plot. And then we have the early instability model where the giant planets became unstable very quickly as soon as the gas was removed from the system. And this removed most of the mass from the asteroid belt. Now we need to understand which of these models is correct. Obviously in the solar system only one thing happened, not three different things at the same time. So in order to discriminate between these models, we need to answer a number of questions. So for instance, for, to validate the Grand Tack or not, we need to understand how outward migration really work when planets, giant planets are still growing, are still accreting gas. For the low mass asteroid belt model, we need to understand if it's realistic that the first planetesimals only form in a narrow ring around 1 AU and why. And for the early instability model, we need to understand the timing of this instability by looking at the number of constraints in the solar system. And also, we need to compare uh, what these models would predict in terms of final composition of the Earth and compare these model predictions with the actual measurement of the chemical and isotopic composition of our planet. So this requires to, that dynamical planet formation models are married to geophysical and geochemical evolution models of our planet. So what's next? How can we improve and solve this, this, these problems? So we need to advance on two sides, on the observational side and the modeling side. Observations are key 
We need observations to calibrate models, discriminate models, inspire models. And the future is bright. We have new instruments coming up that will help us enormously. So to understand disks, we have the ALMA radio telescope, which is becoming more and more powerful. We have a sphere, an instrument built on VLT, which allows to image disks. And soon we will have a new space telescope called, called the JWST, which will also be very effective in observing disks. For extrasolar planets, there are a number of new missions that will be launched, in particular TESS by NASA and PLATO by ESA, that will allow to discover small planets, super-Earths, terrestrial-like, further away from the star, so they look more closely to the actual terrestrial planet in our solar system. The Space Telescope JWST, as well as the ESA Ariel mission, will allow to characterize these planets, understand their composition, the composition of their atmosphere. And W first, which is another space mission, will allow to discover a new category of planets by a technique called microlensing. And these will be planets further away from their parent stars, so probably more typical of the planets in our solar system. On the modeling side, there are many things to do. First of all, the models of disks have to be improved. They have to become more complex and realistic. And this requires to include magneto-hydrodynamical effects, MHD effects, in particular an effect called the Hall effect. And all of this will make the disk even more complex, but probably will give a more realistic description of how protoplanetary disks operate and look like. Then we need to study how giant planets grow and migrate in these more realistic disks. And finally, we need to couple terrestrial planet for formation models that study the formation of the planets on dynamical grounds with geochemical models that simulate how the internal composition of the Earth evolved with the accretion and the differentiation of the Earth. So there is a lot to do and we hope to have many more module projects in the future. Mojo.